Charlotte, take it away. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Hearing my throat right off the bat. <clears throat> Uh, thanks everyone for being here tonight. Um, should be a good program. Um, and Suzanne and I are here to talk about pollinators and how to bring them to um, the garden, bring them to your garden and why we wanna do that. Um, tonight, we're gonna go over uh, what is the Our What Our World program about little, I think a little more than half of you um, are unfamiliar. So we'll talk about what that is. We'll talk about what is pollination, why it matters, how to bring those pollinators to your garden. Um, we'll talk about different kinds of pollinators, the specific kinds and um, what they add to the garden and overall how to protect them. And um, this is going to be recorded. It is being recorded right now. And we will be sending uh, resources out to you after the program. So there's gonna be some links that we mentioned. Uh, don't worry, those things will be captured and sent to you. So you don't need to scramble and write things down. Um, and we are sponsored today by the Clean Water Program of Alameda County. Uh, the Clean Water Program works to protect Alameda County creeks, wetlands, and the bay from runoff that may carry pollutants into the waterways. So what we talk about um, with gardening is avoiding chemicals that can be washed off the lawn and garden um, into storm drains by irrigation and rain. You can learn more at the cleanwaterprogram.org. All of our past webinars, we've done several webinars in the past um, for the Clean Water Program. They are all on the YouTube channel, which you can reach through the website. Um, so today we're not gonna talk a lot about specific gardening, but um, we all of that information about waterways gardening, soil, healthy roses, all that information is on our YouTube channel. Uh, so feel free to go back. And then to sign up to get um, water saving tips and news and events like webinars and in-person events, you can sign up at cleanwaterprogram.org um, and get their newsletter, add your email and get their newsletter. So now, and uh, we are from Our Water, Our World. Our Water, Our World is a, a program designed to bring awareness between pesticides and water quality and provides pest problem solving education. You can find our water, our water, our water, our world materials in over 200 hardware stores and nurseries in uh, the Bay Area and beyond um, and all over the state. Uh, what you'll see in most stores is um, like the photo on the left, a rack with information sheets about um, common pests and how to deal with them and uh, how to you know have healthy lawn and healthy roses and a healthy garden in general. We also see some stores have QR code posters, so you can also get that information right on your phone instead of taking a handout. Uh, you can also um, see on many stores have these blue tags on the shelf that highlight the eco-friendly products on the shelf. You can also learn more. You can see all of the fact sheets, information sheets and learn more about eco-friendly products at our website, ourwateroutworld.org. So why are we so worried about water and pesticides? Um, so this is what we talk about at Our Water, Our World. Uh, we wanna really understand, we all live in a watershed, uh, large and small, um, and we all have a direct effect on our waterways. So um, if you live in Alameda County or the surrounding counties actually, uh, you live in the San Francisco Bay watershed. It's a massive watershed. Half of all of the water that falls in California, either in rain or snow, drains into the San Francisco Bay. And when it comes, you know, from the mountains, um, like down and through, you know, farmland, urban areas uh, or suburban areas, it picks up a lot of materials and that all those materials go directly into our waterways. Uh, when urban runoff goes over our yards and our streets and goes into the storm drains at the storm at the street level. Uh, that water that enters the storm drain goes directly to a waterway. There is no filtration or treatment between um, the, in between. So just we want people to be aware of that when they're doing anything outdoors or indoors, really, um, in their gardens, walking their dogs, washing their car, all of the material and debris can go right to our waterways. So we wanna to try to avoid 
um, as much of that as possible. And of course, we'll talk about how to do some of that today. Thank you, Charlotte. So I am really excited to talk to you all about pollinators and let's just dive in by talking about what is pollination. So many of us know a little bit about pollination, but um, I'm just, let's just straight off the bat, talk about that pollination is accidental reproduction. So a pollinator is something like a bee that visits a flower uh, to sip some ne nectar or gather some pollen. And then those pollen grains are transferred to other uh, flowers of the same species. And so this is going to allow plants to make seeds and reproduce. So essentially pollination is uh, the flower's way to make more plants. So uh, many of us are familiar with bees and butterflies and hummingbirds. They're probably the most uh, famous pollinators, but beetles, moths, some flies and wasps are also pollinators. Uh, and that's what I'm, want, I'm really excited to introduce you all to uh, this afternoon. Uh, but in the tropical areas, we also see bats and lizards, spiders, and even some small mammals, such as the honey possum, to uh, provide their important pollinating services, which I get really excited about. I wish we had little honey possums here that can pollinate flowers for us. That would be really fun. But essentially, pollination is when a pollinator, uh, such as a bee, lands on one flower and uh, before flying to another, pollen from that first flower is, uh, you know, attaches to that bee's little fuzzy body. And then as the bee moves to the second flower, that pollen then gets uh, spread onto the second flower. And that's when pollination occur. So, um, Bees visit flowers for pollen and nectar, uh, which supply uh, nutrients, the nutrients they need. And um, the fuzzier that pollinator is, the more effective they are at pollinating plants. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, and now we'll talk about why pollination matters. So um, without pollinators, we really won't have much food. Um, roughly 75% of food crops and 90% of all flowering plants on the earth need help with pollination. Um, so they need help. Uh, they depend on these pollinators that we're going to talk about today to get that pollination. Um, that equates to one out of every three bites of food it depends on pollinators. Um, and Financially, um, uh, pollinators add $217 billion to the global economy. Honeybees alone, I know there's a lot of honeybee beekeepers out there. Honeybees alone are responsible for between $1.2 and $5.4 billion in um, agriculture productivity just in the United States. So without pollinators, our agriculture, our food supply, and the surrounding landscapes would collapse. Um, they're also essential to biodiversity. Um, pollinators support healthy ecosystems that clean the air, stabilize soil, protect from severe weather, and support other wildlife. Um, when we have um, lots of pollinators present, that is a key measure of a healthy ecosystem. But of course, we wanna talk about that pollinators are in decline and there are a lot of reasons why that is. Some of it is because of habitat loss. Um, when people clear areas for agriculture or urban development, they destroy habitat of, of lots of pollinators. Fires also do cause a lot of um, habitat loss. I do know, they're not pollinators per se, but I do know that ladybugs, there's a ladybug shortage um, uh, right now, and that is because partially because there are uh, were fires in areas where they are commonly living. Um, and then introduction of non-native plant species. Uh, this can lure pollinators away from their more nutritious native species, and it can non-native plants can take over areas where native plants usually exist, so reducing their uh, normal food sources. Climate change can also affect pollinators. Um, warmer temperatures uh, make pollinators move northward where maybe they don't have as many food sources 
and also the temperature swings and intense uh, weather that comes with climate change also does have an effect on pollinators as well. Pests and disease can affect uh, all pollinators, especially uh, bees. There are two main parasitic mites and pathogens, um, such as the par parasitic mite syndrome that impacts bees. And there's also fungal parasites that threaten honeybee populations. Pesticides are also another reason that pollinators are in decline. Um, many pesticides, including eco-friendlies, I'm probably going to say this a lot today, but pesticides, even some eco-friendly pesticides do impact pollinators, especially bees. Um, some pesticides can kill bees outright, um, or they reduce res bees' resistance to disease. They can impair their ability to navigate and reproduce, and they impact the bee's nervous system. And even if bees aren't killed immediately, the other impacts, other impacts affect bees' ability to forage, feed, and reproduce, um, causing more decline. And then lastly, pollution is another effect on why they are in decline. Uh, heavy metals, uh, diesel, synthetic fertilizers, and even light pollution can really impact pollinators. So um, to support our pollinators, we wanna create um, a pollinator habitat. When you create a pollinator habitat in your yard, you're creating a place of habitat connectivity and you can extend wildlife corridors. So there's usually um, pathways that pollinators move throughout um, land over time. And when they're disrupted by cities or urban development, it really disrupts their um, development. So when we can create habitats in our yards, we're adding connectivity to those wildlife corridors. So ways we can do that um, are making sure we have food for the native, for the pollinators, excuse me. Um, and that can be in the form of seeds, berries, nuts, fruits, nectar, sap, pollen, and foliage. We'll talk more about how to choose different food sources uh, shortly. Um, we also wanna have places where the pollinators can raise their young. Wildlife need resources to nest and reproduce to rest and to protect and nourish their young. So that could be um, places that predators have a hard time invading like mature trees, dead trees, thickets, dense brush, wetlands, and burrows. They also need sun and a safe sunny spot, don't we all? Um, bees and butterflies and hummingbirds love sunny spots uh, that are relatively undisturbed by pets and children. So. Um, making sure they do have a safe space in your yard to enjoy that sunshine. Um, in addition to food, uh, pollinators do need water. And this is really important to remember, especially during times of drought. It's not just our plants that are struggling with water, it's the bees as well. Um, if you don't have a spring, stream, or lake, or any natural source near your home, you can create um, a bee bath, like pictured on this slide, a shallow bowl with rocks in it to allow the bees and the other pollinators to access that water without, um, without having it be too deep. And then some sustainable practices around the garden, which we talk about a lot, especially in other webinars, um, but maintaining your garden, uh, focusing on soil health, clean air and water, making sure all of those, the air and water stay healthy, clean and free from poison. So uh, using compost and organic fertilizers and avoiding pesticides. And then lastly, we wanna create shelter or cover for the pollinators to, to create their own shelters. Pollinators need a place to take shelter from bad weather and to hide from predators or hunt for prey. So again, dense shrubs, brambles, uh, wooded areas can provide shelter. And remember a little bit of messiness in the yard can provide refuge for birds and mammals. Um, and this can include piles of branches, untrimmed shrubs um, around the edges of a garden. And we'll probably talk, we're gonna expand a little bit more on all of these topics in the next few, several slides. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about butterflies. 
since they are very popular, many of you are very excited to learn more about butterflies. There's more than 1300 butterfly species native to California, which is really remarkable. Butterflies are very active during the day and visit a variety of flowers. So variety of flowers is important when you want to attract butterflies. We want to uh, plant a nice variety of flowers. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what that could look like in a moment. So butterflies probe for nectar. Um, they are going to look for flowers to gather that nectar on flowers that are primarily flat. So typically what we're gonna see are flowers like tithonia or Mexican sunflower or like asters like this that are kind of upright. They face up and make a, a landing pad. So those butterflies could land and uh, access that nectar with ease. Clusters of flowers are also going to work really well, such as yarrow, which makes a nice flat cluster of flowers. So this is what we're going to think about when we are wanting to attract butterflies to our garden. Something else to keep in mind is butterflies have good vision, but a weak sense of smell. So the flowers don't have to be fragrant. They just need to be, um, well, fairly brightly colored. Okay, and then um, the host plants. Host plants for butterflies may be um, different than the host plants for the caterpillars. So host plants refer to what is the plant that the butterfly likes to get nectar from versus what is the plant that the larval stage or the caterpillar want to feed on. Oftentimes they're very different. So for example, milkweed is the host plant for the larval stage of the monarch butterfly. Okay, so that uh, monarch butterfly is going to cruise around and visit all of these different types of flowers, uh, some are the flowers on the screen pictured here, but then they will only lay their eggs on uh, the milkweed in the garden. So if we've got milkweed, such as the showy milkweed or the slender leaf um, milkweed, they're gonna lay their eggs on that. And then when those eggs hatch, the caterpillar, the larvae of that butterfly is going to then eat that plant as its food source. Okay, uh, something else I'd just like to share is um, uh, we do want to favor the native milkweeds when it comes to monarchs. So the narrow leaf milkweed or the showy milkweed, and we want to avoid planting the non-native milkweed whenever possible. I know I've purchased non-native milkweed in the past. Um, the problem is, is that it interrupts the migration cycle and it could cause them to stick around too long. And then if there is a frost that happens, uh, then it kind of, um, well, brings them to the end, they will get um, damaged by that frost. So please stick to the native milkweeds for butterflies. And then something I just wanted to share is that when we have these plants in our garden, the host plants for the caterpillars, we're gonna to start to see caterpillars and it's really exciting. This is some dill and this is the anise swallowtail in an early instar. Oftentimes the caterpillars will go through multiple instars, which means they will uh, be tiny, shed their skin, uh, uh, grow, um, be a little bit larger. And when they go through these different forms or different instars, their colors sometimes change. So that's something else that's kind of fun and exciting is that it is the same caterpillar, but as it grows, it uh, starts to transition to a larger caterpillar. It will change its colors as well. But because birds really like to nibble on these caterpillars, when it is a butterfly that I am familiar with and I recognize, um, I will drape netting over the plant. Um, I will really net it really high, drape it high so the net isn't touching the plant itself. Maybe I'll put a tomato basket or some steaks and I'll drape the netting over. You can also use tool or anything that's going to be similar um, and that it will prevent the birds from snacking on the caterpillars. And then I wanted to share that uh, the caterpillars number one job is to eat. So when we are uh, inviting butterflies in and we have the host plants 
of the caterpillar, we are really providing a caterpillar nursery, so to speak. We want to learn what the host plants are of those caterpillars of the butterflies we want to attract. So um, if we want to see caterpillars, we have to have those host plants there. And then we want to plant the plants the butterflies like to attract them. So it's kind of like a two part um, process. And then really realizing that these host plants for the caterpillars is their food. So when we start to see nibbles on these plants, do not pant it. Do not, do not panic. These plants are, have been adapted. They're well aware that they are food for these caterpillars and can completely handle getting defoliated by these caterpillars. So by all means, do not panic. Don't freak out. Just know that it's part of the natural process. And by all means, we are going to avoid using pesticides, even BT, which is Bacillus thuringiensis, which targets caterpillars. We really want to, it's eco-friendly, it's very narrow spectrum, but we want to make sure we're avoiding uh, even the eco-friendly pesticides because we really want to support the ecology of the garden and um, the life cycle of all of our pollinators. Moths. So moths are uh, interesting. Many of us don't think of moths as pollinators, but a couple of you did because you met, uh, noted it in the poll, which has made me very happy. I love moths. I mean, not all moths. Some moths are pests, like the ones that like to eat my wool sweaters. But there are more than 11,000 species of moths in the United States alone. And that's more than all of the birds and mammal species in North America combined. Isn't that amazing? So uh, moths are going to outnumber butterflies, which is their nearest relative, more than 10 to one. So some moths are major agricultural pests, but others are important pollinators due to their fuzzy bodies. So remember how I mentioned the fuzzier the body, the more effective and efficient they are at pollinating. So uh, something to keep in mind is uh, when we see moths out, out in our gardens, take a closer look and notice their velvety bodies and get curious and see if we can then key them out and identify who they are. So many moths are nocturnal, but there are also many that are actively pollinating flowers throughout the day, such as this hummingbird moth. Uh, hummingbird moths or striped uh, sphinx moths or white line sphinx, sphinx moths, these are one of my most exciting, most favorite moths to see in the garden. I will share that their uh, caterpillar, their larvae, is something that many of us are not fond of. It's going to be the tomato hornworm, the tobacco hornworm, uh, any of the hornworm family is going to be these beautiful, important pollinating moths. So the next time we have a tomato hornworm uh, devouring our entire tomato plant, uh, please, uh, I invite you, to have a little bit of tolerance, maybe transfer that uh, uh, tomato hornworm into a terrarium with more tomato plants, uh, just so that it can continue its uh, cycle and then emerge as a hummingbird moth. So uh, something else I just wanna share is that pollen pollinating moths do, um, since many of them are nocturnal, do really like night blooming flowers. So it's something else to consider adding to your garden. So night blooming flowers that are pale or white are going to be very popular. Uh, strong fragrance is important because it's dark. And then of course the lighter colors is important because it's dark. And uh, of course flowers that have a lot of nectar are ideal. So uh, night blooming jasmine or cestrum is one of my favorites to plant for our uh, nocturnal pollinators. And then many of us are familiar with bees, but I wanted to dive a little deeper into this, you know, talking a little bit about uh, the European honeybees, but also our native bees, which is a category I find not many of us know much about. But social bees and solitary bees are the two categories. Social bees are those that live in hives and in groups with other bees. And then solitary bees are going to be um, solo artists. They're just going to be living on their own. And their whole role is just to gather nectar and pollen, and then to find a way to a place to lay their eggs and pack those little cells with some food with the egg and then seal up that cell. Together, the solitary and social bees are going to form the largest group of pollinators. There's over 20,000 known bee species in the world. 
incredible. 4,000 of them are native to the United States. 1,600 are native to California, which is almost half. So this is just remarkable. Uh, bees are going to range as small, the world's smallest bee is just two millimeters in size, whereas they can be as large as a kumquat sized carpenter bee. So there is a very large range. They span from tiny to pretty big. Um, only a handful of the bees in the United States are non-native, which includes the European honeybee, which was brought to the United States in the 1600s, okay? Social bees include honeybees and bumblebees. Those are going to be under the umbrella of social bees. And um, what I'll share is a couple fun facts. 1.6 million colonies of honeybees are needed to pollinate California's 800,000 acres of almond trees. That's a lot of bees. Honeybees will fly up to four miles from their hive to collect water, nectar, and pollen. And honeybees are going to visit 50 to 100 flowers during a collection trip. So they are very busy and very active. I just think that's remarkable. All the bees we need to pollinate our almonds. It's just wild. Okay, so uh, solitary bees, um, a lot of us aren't really thinking about all of the solitary bees that are out there in our gardens, but most bees are solitary bees. Um, they actually make up about 75% of all bee species are solitary bees. This is going to include the leaf cutter bees, digger bees, carpenter bees, minor bees, and mason bees you may have heard of, but there's a lot more. These bees live alone and do not swarm. Okay, they are rarely do they have stingers and they are not aggressive. Uh, solitary bees fly around from flower to flower to collect pollen and ne nectar for their eggs. That's strictly the only thing they're doing. Okay, solitary bee will um, bees find or make a hole themselves to lay their eggs in. Uh, roughly 70% of the, the, these bees are soil dwellers. So similar to this illustration that came from the Pollinator Partnership uh, website. Uh, they will dig tunnels in the ground or they'll use abandoned beetle tunnels that they will uh, then um, pack their eggs in and create like little nests. While the other 30% are wood dwellers. They'll use old beetle tunnels in wood or reeds or bamboo or canes, things like that. They will lay their eggs in the tunnels and seal each egg in its own cell within the hole. Food is sealed in with that egg. And then the mother does not return to care for the young as social bees do. So when that egg um, hatches, that uh, the larval and pupal stages of that bee will stay in um, that um, in, in their little cell pod until the spring when they can emerge as an adult. So the materials they seal cells with will depend on the species of the bee. So leaf cutter bees will still seal each cell with leaves. Uh, mask bees will seal those, their cells with a clear waxy substance. Minor bees will use mud to seal their cells. So it's kind of fun. Um, and then, um, yeah, uh, I don't know. I think that's the most I can share about that at the moment, but I just want to invite you to go into your garden and have a look. I just noticed in one of my uh, buddleias that was that died, um, I had cut it back and I was about to dig it out to, um, you know, get rid of it. And I noticed a little native bee going into a hole it had uh, drilled into the stem and it blew my mind. And then a couple of days later, I saw that the hole was packed. So now I have to leave it there because I know that the young are going to emerge at some point. It's very exciting. You can also make bee nesting blocks and the template is going to be either on Audubon, uh, this Audubon Society website or the Xerces Society website. All right, wasps. Many, uh, to many people's surprise, wasps are very important pollinators. I kind of get excited by wasps. I think they're kind of weird. They're really interesting. And they actually are in the same family group as bees and ants. Wasps are carnivorous and they hunt for other insects or spiders, 
but some also visit flowers for nectar. That's when I first started to notice wasps uh, pollinating my plants is when I got particularly interested in learning more about them. Um, the wasps need key, key resources such as pollen and nectar from flowers as a very important part of their diet. And uh, a fun fact I'd like to share is that um, uh, the fig wasp is one of the only ways certain fig trees can be pollinated. So fig wasps are responsible for pollinating almost a thousand different species of figs. So something else that's totally interesting and strange. Okay, uh, flies. Again, many people are unaware that flies are also very important pollinators. Um, they are um, second in importance to bees in pollinating. Flies have been documented to be primary pollinators for many plant species, both wild and cultivated. And for those of you that love chocolate, you have flies to thank since they are the primary pollinator of cacao, which is also really fascinating, isn't it? So flies can also be very helpful in pollinating a lot of other crops, such as pears and apples, strawberries, cherries, Gosh, roses, mangoes, fennel, coriander, so many more. There's a huge long list of plants that flies help uh, pollinate. But surfeit flies are my most, uh, I, I'm most fascinated by surfeit flies and I love them um, really, they're so dear to me. And that's what this picture is here. Uh, they're also um, referred to as a flower fly. We do see them around our gardens. They can either be, they'll range in sizes. I believe there's, 400 species of surfeit flies throughout North America. Um, I might be a little wrong on that. I don't have that note in front of me, but I do remember there was surprisingly a lot of species of surfeit flies. They're either really, really tiny, um, maybe uh, about an eighth of an inch, all the way up to about a half an inch. And they do look like bees. So you'll see them buzzing around. And what you'll see is that they actually can stop and hover similar to a helicopter and dart from left to right. And that's where they get their nickname as hoverfly. Um, oh, I have my notes right here where they're um, this whole family of surfeit flies contains more than 6,000 identified species throughout the world on the globe. So um, that's remarkable. But adults are going to feed on nectar and pollen. Um, they're also extremely important pollinators. They live around the world except for Antarctica and their most favorite flowers are sweet alyssum. I know sweet alyssum is now on the um, the California invasive plant list. However, um, I still am going to, I still plant some sweet alyssum. I just make sure I keep it in check and that it doesn't, you know, expand beyond its boundaries. Yarrow is another uh, favorite. Cat, mint, buckwheat, cilantro and parsley. So I will plant cilantro and parsley uh, deliberately so it will go to flower so I can get, um, uh, so I can support my surfeit fly friends that come to my garden. And beetles. Beetles were, are documented as the very first pollinators uh, known to man. Uh, they make up the largest group of pollinating animals because there are so many of them. They are responsible for pollinating 88% of the 240,000 240, flowering plants around the world. So boy, that's that's a large volume of plants that they are responsible for pollinating. So that's pretty remarkable. So the next time you see beetles in your garden, you know, know that not only are they just cruising around, they're actually helping us pollinate plants. Soldier beetles, as pictured here, not only are pollinating plants, but they're also beneficial insects. They will eat pests like aphids um, and other small bodied insects that might be out there in the spring. And their larva is going to strictly be in the soil eating uh, on soil dwelling pests, such as pest nematodes and eggs of other pests that are about to hatch. So when we see soldier beetles in our garden, get really excited because they're providing an amazing service. And then hummingbirds. Hummingbirds are only native to the Americas. 
They have extremely good eyesight and are attracted to bright colored flowers. Uh, they specifically love orange and reds, like bright orange and reds, maybe hot pink, things like that. Um, hummingbirds must, must eat several times their weight in nectar every day. So it is really important if you wanna attract hummingbirds to plant a variety of flowering plants that are going to offer them the nectar they need. Um, now understand that they also will go for protein meals, especially when they've got little hatchlings. So they're also not only um, really fun to look at and we love seeing them buzzing around our garden, when they've got their little hatchlings, they're out eating uh, small insect pests. Uh, so that's also going to provide a big benefit to our garden to keeping pests down and wind. So many of us don't really think about the wind, but let me tell you, my allergies have been pretty significant lately and it is due to uh, our wind pollinators, okay? So the other remaining percentages of the world's flowering plants are wind pollinated. This inclu includes those grasses, the cereal crops and many trees. Uh, so wind pollinated plants don't normally have flowers, but they do have very small, uh, tiny micro flowers that maybe we don't really notice. They don't have perfume or nectar, but produce a large amount of uh, pollen. So the pollen of this plant group frequently, br frequently brings out symptoms of hay fever and allergies um, to many of us during this time of the year. Wow, thanks, Suzanne. I just learned a lot about all the many different kinds of pollinators. Um, great. So now we know more about what the pollen, who these pollinators are, and what they need and what they do for us. So what can we do for them to protect them? Um, first, we can make sure that they we reduce their predators. So pets. I know my dog likes to chase bees around the yard, which is not great, but uh, so I try to reduce that from happening, but keeping our pets, our children, ourselves as gardeners or our team of gardeners um, from harming their, uh, their, the bees themselves or the pollinators themselves um, and their habitats. You can also uh, protect them from the elements. So uh, making sure some areas are uncultivated and free of mulch. So we do talk a lot about mulch with, at our water world and how much, how wonderful it is but it is really important to keep parts of the, uh, your yard, just small areas of your yard uncultivated. So bare soil, mulch free to allow places for uh, specifically native bees and ground dwelling bees to build their nests. Uh, we wanna avoid leaf blowers cause they can really disrupt um, uh, flight patterns and, and uh, destroy um, shelters. Uh, we want to prune mindfully, so that means really just before prune off um, some, uh, prune back your plants, just check to see if you find any uh, pollinators buzzing around or if there's any like chrysalis or um, nests in that uh, tree or shrub or whatever you're pruning. Just take a look around before you prune, uh, just as Suzanne mentioned with her budlia. And then, um, also, same thing, check your patio furniture before storing. Of course, we don't want to put away some a, a baby pollinator and not give it its chance. And then lastly, we're going to avoid pesticides, even the eco-friendlies, because um, they can harm the pollinators. And then tips for attracting pollinators. I see there's some questions about attracting pollinators in the, in the chat. So um, here are some ways we can do that. We're gonna embrace the seasons, plant for year round blooms. We are really lucky to live in the Bay Area where you, we can have flowers all year round. So just have different kinds of plants that could bloom all year round and stagger blooms throughout the year. We'll, all, we'll provide consistent food for pollinators. Um, we're gonna favor California native plants. These plants want, a, besides just doing better in our environment, uh, will provide higher, uh, better nutrition for the pollinators as well. We're gonna plant in swaths or clumps about three by three feet. 
Um, that is because the more um, the more you know the same plant in an area will attract more of the same more bees and um, it will be more attractive to pollinators to have a nice large area of, of food sources instead of just one popped in here and there. Um, bees also practice flower constancy. Uh, so they will visit the same flower type when foraging, um, even though there might be another option nearby. So giving them lots of options of the same type of flower in one area is going to be beneficial. That doesn't mean we're going to monocrop our yards, but uh, we can have more, if we can have more plants of one type in an area that will be beneficial. We're also gonna avoid hybrid plants. Uh, they can be, these hybrid plants they sell at nurseries can be quite beautiful, um, but they don't often provide sufficient pollen, nectar, or uh, fragrance for pollinators. Um, so instead of, um, we, if we avoid hybrids and plant the, the regular kind, they will provide nutrients for those pollinators instead. And um, we already talked about night bloomers for moths. So just like planting for blooming throughout the year, we wanna have some blooms throughout the day and night. So planting for uh, moths and bats. Um, I think someone mentioned the cestrum. Also moonflower is an option for um, night blooming plants. There's lots of options as well. Then we're gonna include larval host plants. So think of the caterpillars when you're planting and maybe plant some plants that will be sacrificed to them. Um, you might wanna plant them a little bit hidden away if you don't wanna see all the leaf damage, but planting those knowing that they will be eaten will be very helpful for those larval, um, for the larval stage. And then you can consider removing or reducing your lawn. Um, conventional lawns don't really provide any benefits for pollinators. And there is a rebate available at East Bay Mud. If you do wanna remove your lawn or reduce it, you can be paid by the square foot to take it out. And even more so if you replace them with California natives and pollinator um, habitat. And then as we said, we're gonna provide water source like a bee bath that was showed earlier, a low, um, low bowl with rocks in it so that the pollinators can land in and get the water when they need it. And then lastly, I think this is probably the third time I've said it already and I'm gonna keep going is we're gonna avoid our pesticides, even the eco-friendlies. Um, and then, so we would, uh, it's definitely good to consider planting our California natives as we are, we've already talked about. Research has found that California natives provide higher nutrition for pollinators, beneficials, birds, and the overall ecology in the garden. Not only this, but when you choose climate appropriate native plants, they're going to thrive in your garden. They're going to be more adapted to your soil type, your microclimate, um, the lack of water in the summer. Um, and the local pollinators, they'll overall be less work for you, less maintenance um, and happier in the garden as well. And you can learn more about California natives that attract pollinators at this uh, website. Uh, it's the Xerces Society. They have lots of information about bees. And then, so when specifically when we're talking about pollinators and plants for pollinators, we want to pro provide diversity of flowers hours that provide nectar and pollen. So think of color, shape, height. Uh, fragrance doesn't really matter that much, but more diversity, the better. We'll provide different nutrients, different um, access for different pollinators. Um, so when we look, uh, there's several groups of flowers that really attract beneficials and pollinators. There's flowers that look like daisies or sunflowers with that button in the middle and the ray of petals around it. Uh, that button in the middle is really just a cluster of flowers. So um, really uh, easy access uh, for insects with small mouth parts. And it provides a nice landing pad also that like butterflies especially really like uh, to have a landing pad for them to eat. So there's um, some cosmos, aster, Erigeron, um, Helenium, lots of options like that. 
Then we have flowers that grow in clusters of small flowers. So that would be the yarrow, the ceanothus, the lavender. Um, again, tiny flowers. A lot of these pollinators and beneficial insects have small mouth parts, so they need tiny flowers so they can get into that nectar. And then there are um, the pollinators, as we talked about, hummingbirds, butterflies that have longer mouth parts and like those tubular flowers. But of course, they all have different length mouth parts. So having, again, different shape and size tubular flowers as well. Uh, salvias, fuchsias, grevillea, bachelor button, verbena, all of these are have tubular flowers in them. And then here's just some photos of different options. And it shows, it really shows the different shapes and sizes, especially of tubular flowers. So the scabiosa, the nifophia, the agastache, verbena, amimilis all have different shape and size tubes. So different kinds of pollinators can access. And then we have on um, the tithonia, we see a nice landing pad for that butterfly. Um, making it easy for them to access. And different flowers, different colors, different shapes, different heights. And when Charlotte mentioned before, um, grouping plants in uh, swaths of like three feet by three feet, sometimes it could just be one plant. So I know some salvias will grow to be about three feet by three feet. And in that case, you just need one plant. But the idea was just that there's at least a few more um, uh, a little bit more of a mass of flowers for those pollinators, as she explained. Okay, I just am really excited. Um, if there is only one plant you are going to add to your garden, I would like to encourage you to please plant a Habitat Hero. These are my favorites. Now, of course, you might not have space for a California, um, you know, any of the California native oaks because they get pretty big, but our California native buckwheats are amazing. Okay. They are really spectacular, spectacular, spectacular. Oh my gosh. Uh, I can't do that word. Tongue twister. Um, and then manzanitas, uh, ceanothus or California lilac and salvias, a lot of sages. But one note about salvias, native salvias, um, I have planted some native salvias and there are some species that actually are a lot more fussy and require more water than um, the original species. So um, just be aware that not all of the California natives are equal and really learn a little bit more about the different species if you are going to choose one such as the salvias. Uh, these habitat heroes, oh, of course, and then also culinary herbs, as I mentioned before, especially the cilantro and the parsley, thyme, oregano. If you let any of your culinary herbs go to flower, you will see what I'm talking about. They will swarm it. Um, these plants are notable for their ability to attract a significant number and variety of pollinators as well as other important wildlife. So, uh, and you know, beneficial insects. And the cool thing about the oaks is that um, they will actually, for instance, the oak moth uh, will lay its eggs um, and then that little oak uh, tusset moth caterpillar will be there. Just, it looks like it's annihilating those leaves but um, the songbirds are need those moth larvae to feed on. So again, when we have uh, trees in our garden, or if we live in an area, because there are a lot of oaks in the Bay Area throughout East Bay and so forth, if we happen to have one on our property and we happen to see these, um, the caterpillars from a variety of different moths eating the oak leaves, please do not panic. Know that they are food for our songbirds, which it's very important. We need to support the songbirds as well. And these oaks have adapted. They can take it. They can really be defoliated again, as I mentioned before. So uh, please have fun, experiment, and you know, invite a couple of, you know, plant a few habitat heroes to invite more um, friends to your garden. And then Something else I'd just like to share is um, consider allowing plants to complete their life cycle. So here in my picture behind me, this is my climbing aster, which uh, is not a California native that I know of. I don't believe it is. However, it is very um, 
it does get a lot of attention. I love it because it typically is blooming at the very, very, very end of the summer into fall and actually into the winter when a lot of other things aren't blooming. But that picture of the aster on the top left corner is what this looks like when it goes to seed and it's done flowering and birds are then going to hit it and use, eat the seeds, use some of the tufts for nesting. The Japanese anemone as well as clematis are also going to be used as tufts for nesting material. Um, elderberry, um, the berries are really uh, provide wonderful uh, nutrients to, it's a great um, food source for our birds, snowberries, uh, the coast live oak um, acorns. These are also going to be really uh, provide high nutrients for a lot of um, like the squirrels, um, birds, other uh, organisms in our garden that we really want that help keep a very healthy and happy uh, ecosystem. It's all part of our garden's food chain, which is what I'd really like to uh, introduce you to, is that when we have these plants, especially the habitat heroes, and we and other native plants in our garden, and we allow them to complete their life cycle, these plants, uh, especially the native plants, are packed with healthy fats that will uh, provide energy for our uh, birds and other uh, critters in the garden so that they can withstand our winter season. Um, for more uh, information on plants for pollinators, you can always visit the Alameda County Master Gardeners for a nice plant list, the Cal Native Plant Society, specifically the Calscape website, which is one of my favorites when I want to uh, learn about new plants I might want to invite in our garden. And then of course, the Our Water, Our World website has this awesome fact sheet called Planting a Healthy Garden that has a nice list of plants that will grow really well and adapt to our Bay Area climate. And then what I really like to share is that since we've been talking about uh, avoiding pesticides so much and the impacts that pesticides, even eco-friendly pesticides have on our uh, beneficial insects and our pollinators, I would just like to uh, share that when we go for a pesticide, they're not solving the problem. Okay, they're just going to really just be killing that pest. And oftentimes they're also killing other unintended um, uh, unintentional uh, beneficial insects and pollinators. So what we wanna do is always really understand why that pest is there, address the cause, understand the why. And Charlotte's gonna talk a little bit more about um, how we can manage pests without using pesticides in a minute. And something I'd like to share is that um, Neonicotinoids, uh, we hear about them a lot on, you know, um, the social media sites and on the news and things like that. But these are products that uh, work, they're a chemical pesticide that work um, systemically. So we either are going to use them as a soil drench where we'd mix them with a watering can and pour them on the root system around the plant, or we'll spray it on the plant and then it gets absorbed into the cells of that plant and it is then uh, it will pulse through the vascular system of that plant. Uh, one of the most common ones that we hear about is imidacolprid. Uh, something else I'd like to share is that not only does it move through every cell of the plant, including um, the stamen and uh, the pollen and all the parts that pollinators might access, they also spread through their root systems beyond the plant and any roots of other plants, they might be, uh, those root systems might be um, interlocked together with. That pesticide then will move to that other plant. So if we're using this pesticide on our roses, but the root zone of these roses spread under our fence to maybe a wild space or a neighbor's garden that has a lot of flowering plants that attract pollinators, understand there is a chance that this pesticide can actually be moving through the vascular system of neighboring plants through that have you know root systems that have shared. Um, so please avoid using these products at all costs. They are highly detrimental to our pollinators, our beneficial insects, the whole ecology of the garden. And they actually are also a water quality issue. These are find, winding up in our waterways at higher than acceptable levels and are now a, um, a toxin to our waterways. 
And a lot of questions come up about buying plants at our local nurseries and if they're safe and neonic free. Well, you know what we can do? We can actually ask the buyers at these nurseries if their plants are treated or do they have a section of plants that are not treated? So a lot of nurseries, especially around the Bay Area are super conscientious and they're growing from uh, growers that are conscientious. Not all plants are going to be neonic free. Uh, for instance, right now our citrus that we buy is going to be um, treated because of Asian citrus salad. We're trying to avoid the spread of that within the state. But when you buy a citrus like I did recently, I just removed all those flowers for the first year till I knew that pesticide had grown through the plant. It was no longer present. And by removing the flowers for the first year, though, it was a little bit like, oh, I'm going to be, you know, losing these lemons for the first year. Hey, it was my payoff to make sure that my bees were safe. Any bees that came and visited were safe and that, um, uh, and then I just continued to feed it organically and allowed the, um, lemons, the flowers to grow the following year, and they were safe. In that case, um, Suzanne, I'm curious, would you leave, would you, would you think it's better to like leave the lemon in a container too and not oh, put yes. it in the ground? Yes. Yes. Thank okay. you, Charlotte. I have my lemon in a 15 gallon container and it is not in the ground. And okay. so I just wanted to make sure for actually two years, for two years, I removed the um, flowers because I was so paranoid. But what I understand, what I've read and what I, how I know how the pesticide works one year is fine. But, and then again, for more information, people can go to um, info at pesticide.org. And again, we'll send this information out to everybody after the program tonight. All right, thanks everyone. I know it's six o'clock, but we have a couple more slides that we're gonna get through. Um, so I appreciate you sticking around. Um, so as Suzanne said, pesticides don't really solve the problem. They temporarily kill things, whether we want them to be dead or not. Um, so we can avoid them. We don't really need pesticides if we are practicing integrated pest management and planting to protect our pollinators. Um, so we're going to focus on identification of insects. We are going to set up our gardens for success, and then we can, we won't even need the use of pesticides. So um, integrated pest management, I'm not going to go in super depth in, about it, but I'm going to give an overview of what it is. Integrated pest management is, um, it's a decision-making process using science-based strategies, and it really is a holistic view of the garden. So looking at the garden as a whole, as a whole system, as an ecosystem, um, as opposed to just, you know, looking right about, right at um, a pest and dealing with that pest immediately. Taking a step back, looking at the big picture. We also ask ourselves a lot of questions. Uh, what really is the problem at hand? A lot of times when our garden is struggling, uh, we think we're looking at the problem, but we're looking at a symptom of a problem. So really figuring out what's happening. Um, and then can we live with it? This is understanding our thresholds. Certain pests do cause some damage, but they won't totally take down your plant, whereas some are a little bit more challenging. Uh, so some we might be able to live with, some are just nuisances, and then some we do need to take action for. The steps of integrated pest management start with prevention. Prevention um, really just looks like good plant care. So uh, you know, choosing the correct plants, making sure they're happy in their space, using organic fertilizers, et cetera. Uh, those can all be preventative measures. Um, we can also be using tools in the garden to keep certain pests out as well. Um, identification. So if we do have a problem, we want to identify what really is the problem. And then, of course, if it's an insect, we want to know, is it a good bug like a pollinator or is it a pest insect? And then exactly what is it that will make our action steps most, most effective and safe. Then when we want to take action, we're going to use cultural controls, which is similar to prevention very much bolstering the health of the garden. Healthy plants will have less pests and healthy plants can handle pest infestations when they do arrive as well. So if we're always just focused on the plant health, we really don't need to worry too much about um, pests, most pests when they do arrive. 
Then we have mechanical controls, which are physical things we can use in the garden, traps, barriers, and tools. Biological controls, which is a lot of what we're talking about today, are beneficial insects, pollinators, predators, parasitic wasps, um, and supporting the whole ecosystem. Again, understanding the garden as an ecosystem. There's a lot of good things going on there, so we want to support what we can. And then there's chemical controls, which are pesticides, and they're always a last resort in IPM. Um, and some people choose not to get this far if they have always been struggling with a, with a plant. Um, they've done all they can to take the best care of the plant using tools, using uh, encouraging the beneficials, and it's still struggling. There's a good chance that pesticides aren't really gonna help either. Um, so some people just choose to remove the plant. That's usually the best way to go. So we talked about identification. Um, we do wanna identify Again, the problem, uh, is it a watering or fertilizing issue or really is it a pest? That's the first step. Then what pest is it? Um, we wanna understand the life cycle. This will help understand what kind of damage we can expect, how much damage we can expect, and when is best to manage this pest. Um, caterpillars and moths require different, um, you know, same, same critter. Uh, different parts of their life cycle require different management. Then we have, we want to understand the pest's habitat and timing of activity. So where we're going to find these pests and when they're going to show up. Uh, that will help us anticipate any issues and maybe put some preventative measures in place. And then also we'll be monitoring closely. Then we, if we know this pest, we'll understand if it has natural enemies. And if they are present in the garden, we'll of course support them and help them do the pest management for us. So we'll talk a little bit about um, some setting up our gardens for success. This can be preventative measures for pests and also considered cultural controls as well. Uh, we're gonna always add compost to the soil. Compost can turn your soil into a sponge holding water for longer periods of time, giving your plants access to water. Also adds great nutrients to the soil. Feeding with organic fertilizers allows for sustained energy to your plants uh, without running off into waterways. Mulch is uh, super important for weed control, soil health, um, especially now we're talking about mulch and how it is super effective in reducing evaporation and keeping soil cooler. So really cutting down on watering needs. Um, but you do want to, of course, as we mentioned, leave some parts of the area uncovered without mulch, um, without anything, um, because that will be helpful for some ground dwelling pollinators. We're always choosing the right plant for the right place according to our microclimates. And remember, your yard may have many microclimates within it. Um, so really studying your yard, different areas of your yard, and making sure you're choosing the right plants that are going to suit that area well. And that will lead to, of course, less, less maintenance for you, less stress on the plant, and less pests. We're always watering deeply. Um, we're making sure the whole root zone gets access to water and we're using water, especially as we're putting new plants in the ground, we're using water to encourage the roots to go out and down. Um, and we're gonna, as the plant gets established over six to 12 months or more, depending on the size of the plant, we're gonna gradually water less often um, until they are established. Um, and then we're gonna, of course, practice healthy garden maintenance. So making sure we're getting out there in our gardens, looking around, um, inspecting our plants and uh, you know, being actively cleaning up our gardens as needed. We're gonna talk briefly about chemical controls. Um, they are a last resort. Some people choose not to get this far. Um, if you do choose to use chemical controls or pesticides, understand the unintended consequences. This could be you know, harm to yourself, for your pets, your kids, the garden, the other critters in the garden as well. Um, as again, we're using them as a last resort and we're always reading the label. The label has information about what pests it targets. 
um, how to, how and when to apply, how to mix it, what happens if you do get it on your skin or your eyes, what to do about it, um, the, the caution and danger of that, that pesticide. Um, we are going to know our pest, again, that identification, and we're only targeting that pest um, with, we need to know what pest we have and make sure that it's on the label. And we're spot treating um, most, not most, but some, depends on the type of pesticide you're using, but many pesticides require a con to, for the pesticide to become in contact, to be sprayed on the pest, uh, contact kill. Um, so you do need to only spray when the pest is present and on the pest. We're not spraying our whole garden just as a preventative measure. That is just wasting pesticides and potentially harming other creatures. We're always going to use the less toxic option, option eco-friendly products that break down quickly in the environment and do not get into waterways. We're going to spray at the end of the day. This is super important for protecting our pollinators and our beneficial insects. They are less active around dusk. So when we spray at the end of the day, we have less risk of harming them. And also it allows the product to dry on the plant overnight so that when the sun comes up in the morning and all the pollinators come out again, there will be no product wet on the plant. And then we always want to avoid applying when trees and shrubs and all flowers are in bloom um, because we can accidentally harm or confuse or uh, push away any pollinators that are coming to our plants when we spray. And the UCIPM website has this awesome resource, which is the B precaution pesticide rating. So if you do have some pesticides, and I know a couple pesticides, uh, eco-friendly came up in the chat, which is awesome. Thank you for you know, being so aware and for using eco-friendlies, but products like BT or neem, diatomaceous earth, things like that, you can go to this website and you can look up uh, what is the rating and how effective, how it affects uh, the pollinators in our garden. And again, I will be ha uh, this will be on the helpful gardening resource that I will email out to everybody after the program. And then we have the Our Water, Our World website where you can find the catalog, the library of fact sheets that we offer that reference uh, less toxic pest management for certain um, pests. Uh, UCIPM is our go-to for when there's pests in the garden, how to manage them throughout the state of California. Since we are in a summer dry climate, we want to uh, utilize the website that is for our summer dry climate and talks to us how to manage pests in this climate. Uh, OMRI, the Organic Materials Review Institute is also a, a resource to find uh, more uh, products that are going to be eco-friendly and less toxic to the environment. And then if you do have some products, you'd like a little bit more support, uh, the National Pesticide Information Center is one of my favorites. It's very user-friendly. It'll talk about how that active ingredient works, what's the mode of action, and what are some of the unintended consequences we might not have thought of. And then again, the uh, Alameda County UC Master Gardener Program has an amazing list of uh, plants that attract pollinators. Uh, there are some more fun resources to check out that will be on that uh, resource page that I'll email out. That's the Xerces Society, National Wildlife Federation, North America Butterfly Association, Bay Nature Institute, Butterflies and Moths of North America, just to name a few. And with that, I'd like to say when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find a hitch to everything else in the universe. Everything is connected. And here is my little surfer fly friend that landed on my thumb that made me very happy. So as I mentioned before, I really love the surfer flies. And um, thank you so much for uh, there are those that are still with us that for 